What happens when we have two first order transfer functions in series? Or when we have a inherently second order transfer function, such as a uh, spring damped system? Or when we have two coupled differential equations we need to take into account, such as a mass balance and energy balance in a CSTR. And the answer to all three of these is we have to deal with second order dynamics. And the general form of a second order system is this. So we have tau squared, some kind of time constant, times the second partial derivative of your so of some state variable y with respect to time, plus two times a new variable called zeta times tau. And zeta refers to the damping coefficient, which we'll get to, times dy dt plus y is equivalent to the gain k times some input u as a function of time. And when we put this time domain function into the frequency domain, when we take the Laplace transform of it, we find that y of s is equivalent to k, the gain, divided by tau squared times s squared plus two zeta tau s plus one. And so these equations here allow us to model the dynamics of a second order transfer function uh, in Simulink, for example. And the thing to note with these uh, types of second order dynamics is that we now have two poles, two roots of our denominator that we need to take into account. And so pole one, P1, is equivalent to minus zeta over tau plus square root zeta squared minus one over tau. And pole two is minus zeta over tau plus square root I'm sorry, minus square root zeta squared minus one over tau. And to uh, further define these variables, tau is our time constant, and k is our gain. And so there are three cases that we're going to consider um, to see how this damping factor zeta uh, affects the behavior of our second order system. And uh, to do that, I will uh, be analyzing these pole values here, and uh, we're going to examine three cases. And so the first case, if zeta is greater than one, will lead us to get two distinct real roots in our system. In other words, P1 does not equal P2, and all of these are real numbers. And uh, what that means, if zeta is greater than one tells us that our system is overdamped. And in the case of overdamped systems, uh, no oscillatory behavior. And so what this means is if we were to examine how an overdamped system responds to some kind of step input, for example, uh, the graph would be pretty boring. We would just see it uh, look a lot like a first order uh, step change function where it just tapers off to some new steady state value. And so this was case one, 
if we look at case two, if zeta equals one, what we find is that P1 equals P2, and our system is referred to as critically damped. And in the case of critically damped systems, we again see behavior that resembles uh, overdamped systems in which we do not see oscillations occurring. And so the interesting stuff happens when uh, zeta is between zero and uh, one. And for these values, it is referred to as underdamped. And in that case, P1 and P2 are both complex numbers. And uh, this causes oscillations. And so what these kinds of graphs look like are we'll start at some steady state value, a change will be applied, some kind of input uh, step will be applied to our system and then our graph will oscillate about a, a new uh, steady state value. And the thing to note here is, depending on where zeta falls between zero and one, dictates these kinds of values such as overshoot and undershoot and these uh, distance between peaks, also referred to as the period P. And uh, to further analyze how um, in this unique case three, our system is responding, uh, we define new terms such as overshoot. And uh, the way that works in our case three is we get a graph that looks like this. So we'll have um, some kind of new steady state value and we'll assume uh, because y is a deviation from an initial steady state value will be equivalent to y at zero and what will happen is our transfer function will look something like this and these kinds of variables that we deal with uh, will define terms little a little b and little c and uh, sorry about the poor handwriting this variable here is c and so the uh, time periods that we are also interested in um, are referred to as uh, tr t p and another variable called ts and so TR is the time to rise, the rise time to uh, hit the new steady state initially. And so one thing we'll note is that as zeta, as your damping coefficient decreases, and we're built in within the region zero to one, the rise time TR will also decrease. In other words, we will reach our steady state value more quickly. However, our um, overshoot will become larger and larger. And overshoot is a numerical term, uh, numerical quantity we define, uh, also abbreviated OS, and that is equivalent to A over B. And another uh, ratio we were interested in is referred to as the decay ratio, referred to as DR, and that is equivalent to C over A. And it tells us how fast the oscillations die. And so um, essentially, if we thought of zeta as equivalent to, um, sorry, uh, equivalent to how good of a shock absorber you have on your car, 
if you had very poor shock absorbers and your car was just bouncing all over the place, it would uh, infer a very low damping coefficient, very poor shock absorbers. And so if you think of it like that, um, your car will continue bouncing after you hit a pump, uh, some kind of pothole, for example. Um, that indicates that your decay ratio will be very high, as well as your overshoot will be very high. Um, so you do reach a steady state value very quickly, um, but uh, your volatility in your system is much greater. And that, in practice, can present some kind of problem. For instance, if this was pressure, and we knew that our tank could only hold a certain pressure, uh, we could have some kind of catastrophe occur. And so to get back to it, TP refers to the peak time, how long it takes us to reach our first peak in our system, and this is also proportional to TR uh, and uh, as well as zeta. So as zeta is decreasing, as our damping coefficient is uh, decreasing, um, so is our peak time. And then finally, TS tells us the settling time, which is how long to get within 95 to 105% of the new, sorry, steady state value. And uh, so these terms, TP, TS, and TR, uh, allow us to, from a graph, be able to define um, other variables such as the overshoot and the decay ratio. And then another important uh, note to make with these second order transfer functions is that the initial slope of second order systems and anything greater than one uh, is zero. And so if you're looking for a telltale sign, if all you have to go on on an exam, for instance, uh, is the plot of how your output is varying over time, if your output has an initial slope of anything other than uh, of, of, of zero, it indicates that the order of your transfer function must be greater than one. And uh, to add on to this, um, you can look up in textbooks the relationships between the oscillate, um, the overshoot, as well as the decay ratio and zeta, and we can find that they are all functions of each other as well as tau, a time constant. Um, and so uh, these are all tabulated equations we can look up quite readily. And then um, final note to make with second order transfer functions is that we can have second order transfer functions that have numerator dynamics. And numerator dynamics indicate that we have zeros present in our transfer functions, which means we have roots in our numerator. And what that means is we can write g of s to be equivalent to k our gain times tau a s plus 1 over tau 1 s plus 1 times tau 2 s plus 1. And so you'll note the degree of your denominator here is 2, the degree of our numerator is 1. So this is a relative first order system. However, um, it is a, a subset of uh, these kind of second order systems that we'll discuss. And so um, the key takeaway from this is we have three cases. If tau a is greater than tau one, and another side note is tau one is greater than tau two in all of these cases, um, what we'll note is that we have overshoot present in our graph uh, if we were to analyze this. So um, essentially indicates that zeta must be between or is an element from zero to one um, in which case uh, we'll have some kind of oscillation like that occurring in our plots if zero is less than tau a is less than or equal to tau one 
it tells us that this is a pseudo first order dynamic system in which case uh, we would in our plot see a maximum slope occurring at t equals zero and finally uh, if tau a is less than zero we will get something referred to as inverse response an inverse response is counterintuitive because when we apply some kind of step input to a, a system uh, we get a different reaction from what we'd expect before uh, the system corrects itself and trends towards what we uh, theoretically expect to happen. And so uh, what those kinds of graphs look like, if this was our initial steady state value, and this will be our final steady state value, is an initial negative behavior followed by um, a, uh, a change and then get close and then um, approach uh, our new steady state value. And uh, the same can be also said for the negative uh, version of this. Um, and so examples of this would be distillation column, um, reboiler duty changes. And so uh, when we're analyzing the height of the liquid in uh, distillation columns, if we modify the reboiler duty, the amount of heat that we are putting into our bottoms uh, plate, uh, that can have the opposite effect of what we'd expect. Because when we heat up our system, we're expecting to evaporate more liquid, we're expecting our level to, to drop, um, but the uh, steam causes condensation in trays above initially, which causes the water level to rise. And so um, there's, there is physical systems that uh, exhibit this kind of inverse response uh, and distillation columns are an example of that. And so this concludes a general introduction to second order systems that we deal with in process control. And I hope you guys find this useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.